Let's start off with the second session, and we are delighted that we have with us uh, again this year Michael Rothenberg, who's one of the founders of this movement, the spirit behind it, and he's um, somebody who's organized uh, uh, conferences, readings uh, under this banner um, for the last 11 years now. But let me give you his brief bio, and then um, I will let him speak about the movement itself, uh, maybe provide some background to it and its pertinence today. And then also uh, he will share a couple of his poems with us. Uh, so this is what is going to kick off our, uh, our second session. Michael Rothenberg is a poet, artist, and activist. He is editor and publisher of bigbridge.org, co-founder of Poets in Need, a, a, a nonprofit, 501c, assisting poets in crises and co-founder of 100,000 Poets for Change. He's the editor of Way More uh, West, New and Selected Poems of Edward Dorn, Penguin. Uh, David Scopy, Selected Poems of David Meltzer, again, Penguin. Uh, as ever, se uh, Selected Poems of Joanne Kiger, uh, Penguin Books. Uh, Goof Book for Jack uh, Kerouac by Philip Whalen, Big Bridge Press. And over time, selected poems of William uh, of Philip Whalen, Penguin Books, and was the winner of the American Book Award. He's also uh, editor of the collected poems of Philip Whalen, Wesleyan University Press. Rothenberg has published over twenty books of poetry. Has most uh, his most recent books include Drawing the Shade, Dos uh, Madras uh, Press, Wake Up uh, and Dream, Mad Hat Press, The Pillars. Uh, Quarantine Press, and I Murdered Elvis, Alien Buddha Press. In memory of a bunion tree, poems of the outside world, 1985 to 2020, Lost Horse Press, and Wildflowers for the Bullies, Flower Song Press, uh, which will be published actually in 2022. Rothenberg uh, lives in Tallahassee, where he is um, Florida State University Libraries Poet in Residence and frequently performs in the Echo Sound Ensemble. He has visited Agnes Scott before uh, with Terry Carrion, his partner, and they have provided an excellent sort of uh, opportunity to hear them, uh, hear us read, uh, hear us um, uh, their poems, uh, give us a reading of their poems, as well as um, a lot of information about their interests, the background of the movement, uh, 100,000 Poets for Change, and so on. So it is a great honor to have uh, Michael here with us, who despite a very heavy schedule has made time for us. And so I'm handing this over to Michael uh, uh, for his particular part in this. Thank you very much for having me. I, I, I'm always like to see you, Kaz, and I, I'm really grateful to be able to participate somewhat in, in Agnes Scott edition of 100,000 Poets for Change. 100,000 Poets for Change started 11 years ago. It was, uh, came about because I was upset about the way I felt the poetry and the arts community was responding to political and social issues uh, that were pressing at the time. Uh, the, the Gulf War, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico was on fire. And I felt that poets were, not all, but many, many poets had just sort of dropped out of the scene, that it was kind of not cool to be screaming and shouting and doing what I learned that poets do you know, when I was coming up. And um, so I, I was telling a friend, I said, there ought to be 100,000 poets for change. And they said, what a great idea. And I thought, Oh no, an idea, <laughs> trouble. What does that mean I have to do? And then I thought, well, nobody really would do it. I mean, I'm just, it's just nothing's happening. I mean, I should need to just do my work and forget about it. But just to prove that no one cares, I'm gonna post it on, on Facebook, I'll create a event page and Facebook called 100,000 Posts for Change. And, and I'll say, if you want to participate in an event uh, for peace, justice, and sustainability, um, let's pick a date in September and um, do it. And I, you know, come along, you know, like 
during the day, I, there's five or six people wrote, I'm in, and I'm in, you know, Jamaica, I'm in, uh, and I'm in, in, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. It's like, okay, six people. Well, that, that's pretty cool that anybody really cared. And, and um, then the, as the, the days progressed, uh, there's 15, 20, and people were writing, you know, I'm going to do it in, in Cincinnati. And, and I'm going to Terry, my, my wife's partner, and saying, hey, Terry, you know, it's really interesting, but there's like 20 people from different places in the world who said that they would organize an event for 100,000 poets for change. And, and um, I think that's pretty cool. And she's like, I thought you were over this, Michael. I thought you were like, retiring from the activism thing. I mean, enough, enough, and it's Facebook anyway. Nobody's gonna do anything, people just say things. And I said, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's nice. It's a nice thing, I mean, I should probably do it. And then, well, it went on maybe the end of, by the end of the week, there was 50. And I think that's a lot of people, and I'm sorry, there's like 50 people who are saying they're gonna do it. So. Terry comes and looks at my computer. I said, look, 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 look. You know, I'm scrolling down, you know, you know, Mumbai and in Mexico City. I'm doing it. I'll do it. And she's going like, wow, that's actually pretty amazing. Well, we ought to organize this properly. And she set up a website. And uh, we started creating these event pages for people so we could keep a record of who's, you know, participating. And um Stanford University contacted us. They said that this was the, uh, they described it as the, the largest poetry event in history, which I thought was excessive. But I mean, I liked it, it sounded great. And then, um, so come September, there were 700 groups, groups around, around the world in 95 countries people said that they were going to do it. And the night before the big day, which we chose the last Saturday of September, we, I got a call from Mongolia and they're telling me that they were had 13 events scheduled for Mongolia. And I mean, I had to, honest, I, I know kind of where Mongolia is, but I had to look <laughs> it up and, and make sure I said like, there's 13 events taking place there. And I was getting videos from people all summer, like people talking about why they cared and people started to send in posters and they're beautiful. So we created a poster gallery and we played, figured a way to upload all the videos that were coming in. And it was, I mean, I was in tears a lot of times just seeing what people felt and seeing that people cared and, um, and interesting that the communities that were created were new communities, not like for me, like it wasn't the same crowd I was used to hanging out with. It was because they, not everybody responded in my local community. So I refigured my community based, and it was a difficult and it was frustrating and it was painful because I did find there were people who I always thought were in it with me who weren't. And, but I grew out of that. And I think that people all around the world had a very similar experience of reconfiguration of their communities, of who, 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 who they could share in their concerns. And um, we had two basic concepts um, that you, peace, justice, and sustainability are the guidelines that we talk about positive change and we're not inviting white supremacists or homophobes. We're not inviting that kind of change. When people say, what kind of change are you talking about? We're talking about peace, justice, and sustainability. Those concepts in, embody the basic uh, uh, vision that I'm trying to see take place. And, um, uh, so, but on a local level, I do not feel that it is my, that I have the knowledge or the, or the right 
to say, well, Agnes Scott should make their theme this, or that the world should make their theme this, that the local community determines the, what focus, how their event should look, whether they want to talk about hunger or war or, or gender equality or in general terms or censorship, that that's up to the local communities to decide what they want to do. And it's not my right to, to, to impose that. And the other basic principle is that there are no exclusivity. Like if you write me from say Macedonia and you say, I want to have, I want to be the, the exclusive organizer of 100,000 poems for change in Macedonia, um, that we did not endorse that idea that everybody, anybody <laughs> can organize an event in their community. And in fact, we had 25 events in San Francisco the first year. And people said, well, why do you have so many events? And why isn't everybody working together? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. Like, go where you feel comfortable and see what happens. And next year, there might be less events and events could combine and commune. I mean, somebody might, one person who might want to organize could be a real jerk. And why should you be obligated to go to their event? Anyway, I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, let, let the community decide. So that's, that's really all that 100,000 Poets for Jane has done and, and de-emphasize the, the leadership concept that I, Terry and I are very honored that people appreciate us for what we're doing. But we want to be provide a platform for change and for the organizers and local communities and not for ourselves. That this is not a place for us to stand and be something important. This is something for you to be important about, for you to be empowered by, for you to go out and feel motivated to do something for your community, to educate each other and to educate yourselves. That's what it's about. So we do de-emphasize that idea. And um, I think that says it all. And um, I mean, if anybody has any questions, I can answer that. But um, I think that says it all. And, uh, and I have a couple of poems. Mm -hmm. So thank you. OK, the first poem. She wants to know if I am pro-Muslim. Why not pro-Muslim? Of course, I am pro-Muslim, hugely pro-Muslim. Pro-Muslim, like my life depends upon it. And while I'm at it, I am pro-Jew, pro-Christian, pro-Buddhist, pro-fish, pro swan, pro-rose, pro-daffodil, pro-biotics, pro-sun, pro-sky, pro-moon, pro-trout, pro-limpkin, pro-marmalade, pro-peanut butter, pro-valone, pro-cheddar, and pro-poetry. Have you got a problem with that? And the second poem that I have is um, one that came from a conference that we did in Salerno, where I met Wakas. And it is, um, we, we had a gathering of organizers from around the world who came to, um, came to Italy without, without the reassurance of a, mobile corporation endorsing us or um, Mick Jagger as the lead uh, <laughs> star to, to, ver to legitimize us, that people on good faith showed up in this town in Italy from around the world from Egypt and Mexico and uh, Agnes Scott and, and Ohio and 
I mean, it was that place in Italy. Oh, obviously it was in Italy. So all around, so they came. So this is the piece that I wrote for that. There will be queens, presidents, laureates, and slaves. Kakata and a calamity of brass bells in a chorus at 2 a.m. when the shadows stretch and bend across the heavy doors of the spirit swollen church. Poets from Paris, Sacramento, and Kuala Lumpur will begin a serenade, take on a puppet Broadway, a stone choreography in the piazza, while children in pajamas crawl out on moonlit balconies, watch through curtains of night drying laundry, dripping blouses and large pink underwear, the dance and fermentation of the spoken word. There will be a quink, a mutant rhyme, a seagull cry, then change will come. A breeze from the broad blue Tyrrhenian sea, the resurrection of green with every lava buried breath, disabling cobble and utopian abracci. It will come, the change. And then the children will go back to bed. The police will never say a word. The clock will unwind and all the poets of the world will march in celebration of another broken law, another pantomime of insurrection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Again, very moving, very uh, impactful as always. Very grateful that uh, we got to know each other and that we have stayed as we are close to each other and feel like brothers. So this is uh, a special gift that this movement and poetry has given. Uh, and I'm thankful for that. And thank you for being too. here. Thank you. Thank I you very much. Too. With all love. Thank you. Take care. And so we move on to the next speaker. Um, and this is Anji Sarumi, who also has graced uh, our uh, event uh, several times in the past as well. And she has been an independent organizer, organizer for 100,000 Poets for Change as well um, on multiple occasions. He is a professional uh, Agile consultant, uh, author, singer, and poet who likes to explore the inner and outer ideas of the world in a way that, as she explains, that poetically illuminates the experience for the audience. Poetically illuminates the experience for the audience. She is a fellow organizer, as I said earlier, uh, 400,000 Poets for Change. She's done that on several occasions um, and has been published in What Kind of uh, Seed Am I? Earth Poetry uh, from the Garden, uh, Wind Eagle Press, um, and then After the Pause magazine, uh, Georgia's Writers, Exit 271 Journal, and in many other publications. Uh, please welcome uh, Angie Sarumi. Please, Good Angie. Everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for that kind show, Walker. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'd like to also thank Michael for, for in it with him. It's been such a rewarding experience to connect with other poets like-minded poets who care about peace, change, and sustainability. I found myself mid-journey and on my way to where I had planned to share with you today. So I asked two things, if you can help me with time and then please be patient with me to move around as <laughs> I have a bit of a Charlie horse I'm trying to work that out as I share. 
two of my poems and then I'll check the time. The first one, titled Sidewalk. Sadly littered with belongings of people who have been longing to appeal to the humanity of a landlord. The rent you see could no longer be afforded. What recession he howled with hearty laughter and called the sheriff's department. When officers arrived, arrived, they were shocked to see families and children, things described that had to be got rid of. Are you sure you want to do this one? One officer asked. The law is the law. Just throw them out. Unit one, unit two, throw out baby carriages, black shoes, brown shoes, discarded books, wedding pictures, the last suppers, painting, coats, underwear. So many things they never had a chance to pack. And my next one is called Escape Valve, which I love because even today, as I had to find a quiet place to share with you, um, always the place where I go to you as my escape valve. There it is again. And she... Excuse me. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your voice is breaking up. Uh, is is there? Uh, Let me, let me try. Yeah. All right. Here we are. Let me know if that's better. Uh, indeed, okay. much better. Perfect. All right. So escape valve. There it is again, a little smile, pressing corners like an iron's release, just a little more steam from my mind, my heart, spacious green, blue skies, my favorite place, my escape valve. I start on winding trails, delight in toadstools that wait for toads, wind blown, pussy willows wave, I long and deep exhale makes me lighter. Lizard crossing, I yell to myself, as I catch the smiles of smiling people who know the secret. I hear Lady Hawk's squeaky cry from majestic oak perch above, clicks and chirps of birds, chorus glorious symphonies, sun smiles from behind clouds and mute golden kisses on my face. I exhale, release, just a little more steam, my headache lifts unto gentle winds, past playground squeals of little kids on unoiled swings, all sing, you can't catch me, na 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 na. Perspiration guides me lakeside to a gazebo of cool breezes, fishes and frogs, turtles, waterfalls, dragonflies, flies, water skippers that all dance on glimmering pond. And how am I doing on time? You're doing fine. You can read another poem if you wish to, Andrew. Okay, so I'd like to. So those two poems were from my collection of poetry called Life's Epiphany. And now I'd like to share a poem by one of my favorite authors, um, June Jordan. Let's see if I can navigate this. It is entitled Manifesto of the Rubber Gloves. So I'm wearing brand new loud blue rubber gloves because I'm serious about I don't want to die from mainstream contamination, mainstream poison water, poisonous like statistical majorities that represent poison waters, poisonous like neo-Nazi perspectives that reflect mainstream poison waters like scapegoat policies that distill the mainstream, poison waters poisonous like the Congress and the government and the president and the supremely Clarence retrograde Thomas Court of separated and unequal, of proud about that last resort.
I'm still reading. I just want to turn the page here. So I'm wearing brand new loud blue rubber gloves because I'm serious about I don't want to die from mainstream contamination, mainstream poison water, poisonous like the FBI and the ATF and the INS and Secret Service security guards with or without a cut on anybody's finger and appointments overflown armed force afraid to fight unless it gets a not a single cut on a single one of your fingers guarantee backed by a would-be hero's welcome just for hiding the hell out of trouble when the point might very well be the trouble the 600,000 human beings are already dead anyway in bosnia I'm wearing brand new loud blue rubber gloves because I'm serious about, I don't wanna die from mainstream contamination, poison waters, poisonous like a serial killer. Start any place next door and slash and dismember and move on and on and kill more and more a serial killer, absolutely mainstream, tall and good looking, nicely dressed, a dedicated fast traveling serial killer straight from the heartland oozing mainstream poison waters, a Republican or Democrat, a soft-spoken young man, a believer in Jesus Christ, a serial killer like the pilgrims, like the early serial pioneers beginning with any body indigenous. And then XYZ and then ABC and always beating up and always hunting down the poor and the niggas and the kites and the wetbacks and the chinks and the, and the dikes. I'm serious, I don't wanna die from mainstream poisonous waters, poisonous at flood, tide heights and depths of programmatic legislative, circular, self-righteous, white, black, Baptist, Vatican, or secular or in-between or accidental, multi-ethnic conservation, consecration to my death. I'm wearing brand new loud blue rubber gloves because I'm serious about, I don't wanna die from mainstream contamination, mainstream poison, waters, poisonous and swollen all around me. And as far as I can see, I'm serious because I don't wanna die. I don't wanna die. I don't wanna die. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angie. As always, very powerful presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to our next poet, uh, a dear friend, Franklin Abbott. He's a poet, a psychotherapist, activist, and original member of the Radical Fairies. Franklin Abbott is author of two collections of poetry and a CD of original music and poetry. His publications include Men and Intimacy, Personal Accounts Exploring the Dilemmas of Modern Male Sexuality, Boyhood, uh, Growing Up Male, uh, Mortal Love, Selected Poems, 1971 to 1998, Pink Zinnias, Poems and Stories, and an album of contemporary jazz, Don't Go Back to Sleep, with vocals by himself. Uh, Franklin, please take the digital stage. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Wakas. Thank you for doing this. It's been my, my pleasure to join you a number of times now. And uh, one of the, the things that I always appreciate so much is that I get to hear people I've never heard before. And this time, I'm also very happy that a number of people that I know from, you know, California to Kashmir have, have <laughs> are a part of the program. So uh, that's been that's been a joy for me. Thank I like that. Me. California to Kashmir is wonderful. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, needless to say, like many of us, uh, I've had more time to write and reflect, you know, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and I have written and reflected. And the things that I have written about, I, I think may have passed me by in my busier life. Uh, when you think about a life where, uh, you know, before the lockdowns, you know, there, there might have been 15 or 20 things that happened in a day. Um, many of them would just pass you by. You wouldn't think about them. That, that would be, you know, they would just float down the river. Uh, if there are two or three things that happened during the day, you know, you have one real conversation with one real person, you know, that may stay with you. And so the, the poem that I wanted to, the first, I have two poems to read. Uh, the first one is about a conversation like that. 
Um, it's called Mike the Bug Man, also known as Michael Hamilton, African American, six feet tall, and always in a light blue cap. He is an independent exterminator, a Vietnam vet, and 79 on his last birthday. Mike is one of my favorite people, not only because he sets traps for rats with peanut butter in my attic and garage and dust for roaches and sprays around my house, sending a signal to spiders. Mike has a story and he is telling me about his life. One of 13 children, he consoles me on the death of my mother and we do the math, his mother died at 63. He says he hated his father. His father beat his mother, impregnated her and beat her. And Mike says when he became a Christian, he had to repent. He had to let go of his hatred. He said it is time to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. He said it is so awful there. He said we have to take care of my own or our own. And I with my soft hands and remote compassion Think of the fall of Saigon and wonder who will protect the women and the children and the queer folk when the hateful Taliban overrun Kabul and Kandahar? Will there be tent cities in the backyards of Bush, Cheney, and the Clintons? Will Barack and Michelle be serving soup in my garden? Will those who flee medieval morality be given a space to raise bees and corn and tomatoes and sleep at night and sleep at night and sleep at night, free of fear, free of fear, free. Mike and I had that conversation about a year before we withdrew from Afghanistan. So it's, you know, one of those things that um, came back to me when, when I saw what happened. Uh, I, I try to ration the news and I try to ration it in terms of being informed, but being particularly sensitive about images that are disturbing because I've got to live with myself. I have to sleep at night. Uh, I, I'm a therapist. I have to pay attention to other people. Um, but every now and then something will slip through in the news cycle that will have an impact on me. And uh, this image, probably many of you will, will resonate with it, um, had such an impact. Uh, the name of the poem is You Bless Our Future. Refugee, how to flee. First question, how deep is the sea? How wide is the land? Can we withstand? Second question, floating in uncertainty. Will I be allowed or returned? Third question, should I relent or persist? If I am where I have chosen to be, if I have fled my homeland, if I have taken my children and elders on a long march from home to the sea, and if we have been given life jackets, more life expectancy than we had, and we were hungry and thirsty, and holding on to each other. And we know a sister was about to give birth. And then they stole the motor from our boat and pushed us back with their oars. And we languished in the unforgiving sea. We did not give up loving each other. We gave each other breath. How many days did we love each other into life? How did we learn with famished hands, exhausted hands, old hands, children, children's hands, hold, 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 and we held on. For us and for you who were born here now, we knew you were coming. We knew we were bringing you to peace and plenty. You bless our future, our future. You bless our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, uh, Franklin. Uh, much comfort also, much poignancy in those poems. 
Thank you for sharing them. Uh, our next reader, um, some of you may begin to wonder how many outstanding Agnes Scott alums there are. And I would say as many as the stars in the sky, there's a whole lot of them. And even among them, there are those that shine a little bit more brightly than the others. And our next uh, guest is Leela Maryam. Um, she is an Agnes Scott and UGA graduate, currently teaching literature at Oglethorpe University. She was born and raised in Croatia, but her diverse family background has afforded her the opportunity to intimately explore the intersections of culture and religion with lived human experience. A very warm welcome to you, Leela. Please. Uh, Thank you so much. Take the stage. Sir. It's a pleasure to be here, and I just realized that um, I've engaged, I've, I've had that pleasure since 2019, so I'm really happy to, to be with you all today, and thank you. Um, as you said, I usually write about the immigrant experience, um, and what does it mean to connect to others, to create a community, and to communicate with each other. Um, today, I would like to start um, by reading a poem by Camilla Moon. Mm -hmm. um, just in honor of her, it was. In case you don't not, don't, were not there when we started out, this entire program is dedicated to Camilla Aisha Moon in her memory. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, this one is titled Mercy Beach. Stony trails of jagged beauty rise like stretch marks streaking sand hips. All the earth has borne beguiles us and battered, battered bodies build our acres. Babes that sleep in hewn rock cradles learn to bear the hardness coming. Tough grace forged in tender bones, may this serve and bless them well. They grow and break grief into islands of sun-baked stone submerged in salt kisses, worn down by the ocean's ardor, relentless as any strong loving. May they find caresses that abolish pain. Like earth, they brandish wounds of gold. I should have ended with that because now I'm going to read a couple of mine. <laughs> um, this one is titled, Hello. Hello, I am still within my egg, welcome. This here is my kitchen with its dirty dishes and the limestone salt cellar imported from the Adriatic. Continue through to my decades of literature, late nights hiding the reading light, the courses, the schools, the students hundreds of students, hundreds of books. And over here is the trauma room. It's been contained quite nicely, one of my best works, cocooned in layers and layers of no. Here's my husband, my dog, my fascinating ancestry, my philosophy of life. Here is my daughter even. I feel a crack sometimes thinking of her. I superimpose her with myth. I fear I'm shaping a false god. Here are the gods rattling in the drawer to the left of the fridge. Can I get you something? What are you hungry for? Um, I have one more. Woe is me. Travel is so trendy. Everyone should visit a hotspot or two in the right season with the right people on this crusty film, the rocky surface of the earth. I took to traveling early. I was your veritable ingenue. I swung through tropical rainforests, lean mussels, clutching lianas, drinking antelope blood. Then there was goat milk and bread in the Swiss Alps, a quaint life with few friends, a tentative grandfather. I'd visit the 17th century, become a witch and preach freedom. There were others. My best friend lived in the wilderness of the West. Killed as a martyr by the end of the series, he took on the mantle of a godhead. So I went on a pilgrimage. I arrived to my first concrete jungle. I spoke English and looked for whatever mysteries the death would have left behind. I found pyramids of glossy red apples, neat rows of non-perishables, and curios of relics. Not a wormhole in sight. At some point, I too assumed a shape this new world allotted me. And though I travel plenty, all leaving is illusion. Thank you. This is this is amazing. Though I travel plenty on leaving is illusion. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it, Leela. We move on now across the oceans 
in India again, and Mr. S.M. Yaya Ibrahim, who is an assistant professor and head of department of English at Kareem City College, Jamshedpur, Jharkhand, India, will be our next uh, participant uh, poet. Uh, though American literature, especially American drama, is his area of research, Mr. Yaya specializes in Commonwealth literature and Indian writing in English, too. He is the chief editor of Das Literatish, uh, a biannual peer-reviewed international journal of create English creative writing and literary studies. He writes short stories in Hindi and Urdu, composes poems in English only occasionally, and translates from Urdu Hindi to English. Uh, please welcome Mr. Yaya Ibrahim and Mr. Ibrahim, most welcome. Mr. Yaya Ibrahim, are you there? Am I missing him? I introduced him, but I he may not be here. I'm checking. I do not think he is signed in. So pardon that introduction. I'm we're missing Yaya Ibrahim. Well, we'll move just across the border now uh, to Pakistan. Uh, Nayara Rahman would be our next uh, participant. And um, she's an award-winning writer and poet. Her laurels include the Sark uh, Young Writers Award and uh, a SAMPAD Award for Poetry. She has won. Uh, she was one of five winners of a national short story writing competition by the British Council. Her work is featured in the Journal of the Sahita Academy of India. Her writing has also been a part of the Pakistan Academy of Letters annual journal. And she has several anthologies to her credit as well, uh, including Dilli, Trainstorm, The Silver Anklet and other stories, and Half the Sky and other stories. Her fiction has been included in anthologies published by OUP, uh, by Kuni and HarperCollins, India. Uh, Nayara Rahman, please take the digital stage. And well, oh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, and thank you. Thank you again. It's, it's great to be here. Um, it's uh, an event I do look forward to for almost uh, the entire year. So it's, it's really great. Uh, I'll start by reading um, a, a, a four part poem called Confessions. Uh, it starts like this, um, confession number one. I join in when platitudes of hope are being passed around. It is just a game and we must lie to play. Nobody wins. The second uh, confession is the leached hours of my life are in your credit card. I will watch as you hand them to a stranger and wait for you to pretend you respect me too. Confession number three. Your raised hand and your eyes, small and ominous, stay with me. They bend my shoulders when I am proud or should be. They lower my voice when I am silent and should not be. Confession number four. I know your words come true. This should comfort me. It does not, but my life is the weight that says they will. Uh, then uh, there's a second poem, uh, it's called Every Day. Every day, my mind promises not to leap at the sound of your voice. It breaks that promise every day. Every day, my blood rushes, tearing the fabric of my veins to meet you as you walk through the door. Every day, I pray for you to say something I can believe, but the prayer leaves, drooping, shamefaced, unanswered every day. In harsh lucidity, I often wish this could be our shared pain, or yours at least. But you live in a haze of careless smiles, lies soiled with kindness, and the great deity that is yourself. Why are there two? to worship you, one must stop. This is something I tell myself every day. Uh, and finally, the third poem, uh, which is um, uh, a commentary on the corporate world. Uh, it's called uh, Shiny Bar. 
shiny bar. My fingers are clasped like my youth around this shiny, merciless bar. It looks like gold. It once was. Now it is just a shiny, merciless bar. The despair in my grip sieves, dilutes, rinses the nectar of each aspiration until the hopefulness of my dreams is reduced to the cookie cut coldness of a to-do list of instructions from the master of this shiny, merciless house of bars. If I was a bird, my wings would comfort me. If I was unafraid of freedom, the shiny, merciless bars would be a provocation. Alas, I am just a miracle, desperate to be buried in that nameless, faceless board, boasting about each bar that includes them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Naya Rahman. Uh, appreciate your contribution. Uh, we move on now to the next speaker. The person listed here for the next reading is Kai Jackson Isa, but I don't believe she is um, logged in at this time. Um, am I right in, in assuming that or coming to that conclusion? Because I don't see her name uh, in the list here of those who are signed, uh, signed in. So we will move on to uh, Zoe Salveson, who's a second year student at Agnes Scott College. Uh, she is majoring in computer science and physics, but still loves English and writing just as much and thinks that quantum physics is the coolest thing this stubbornly non-fantasy world has ever done. So, Zoe Salveson, welcome. Zoe, I did see you sign in, so there you are. Could you unmute yourself? You may not have unmuted yourself. Oh, it is a button on the left that would say mute and unmute, and you should be fine. Were you able to do that, Zoe? Leah, may we have your help in this? Yes, it should be a button at the bottom. Oh, Zoe left. She's coming back in through the waiting room now. Okay, all right, okay. Hi, um, sorry. It, I don't know, it was saying that it didn't have permission to use the microphone. So I was trying to sort that out in the settings app. I'm not sure what it did, okay. but um, it's working now. Yeah, it's um, fine. We can hear you. Um, I'm just going to read one poem. I, it's um, Failing and Flying by Jack Gilbert. I've been mm -hmm. thinking about it a lot recently for some reason, just mm -hmm. in terms of like trying to enjoy the moment, even if like stuff is like going badly or like I think stuff is going to go badly. Mm -hmm. um, Everyone forgets that Icarus also flew. It's the same when love comes to an end or the marriage fails and people say they knew it was a mistake, that everybody said it would never work, that she was old enough to know better. But anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Like being there by that summer ocean on the other side of the island while love was fading out of her. The stars burning so extravagantly those nights that anyone could tell you they would never last. Every morning, she was asleep in my bed like a visitation. The gentleness in her, like antelope standing in the dawn mist. Each afternoon, I watched her coming back through the hot, stony field after swimming. The sea light behind her and the huge sky on the other side of that. Listen to her while we ate lunch. How can they say the marriage failed? Like the people who came back from province when it was province and said that it was pretty, but the food was greasy. I believe Icarus was not failing as he fell, but just coming to the end of his triumph. Um, thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, again, a very good selection of a poem uh, to share, and thank you for that share. Uh, we move on to our uh, next poet. Elias Raymer writes under the name of Andrew, Ra uh, Andrew Raymer, uh, an ordained uh, Majid, uh, sacred storyteller in the Jewish tradition. Uh, Maggot, uh, maybe the uh, pronunciation of his books include Two Flutes Playing, Queering the Text, Fragments of the Brooklyn Talmud, Revelations for a New Millennium, and he co-authored the bestseller, Ask Your Angels. His next book, Two Hearts Dancing, a spiritual journey book for gay men, will be published later this year. Born um, in Elmhurst, New York, across the street from an amusement park called Fairyland, he now lives in Oakland, California, up the street from an amusement park called Fairyland. Um, so, very welcome, uh, uh, Elias Raymer. Uh, please um, take the stage, the digital stage. Elias, I'm sure I saw his name there, and now, oh, there he is. You'll have to unmute yourself, Elias. I don't see that you've unmuted yourself. Technological issues. Uh, I wonder if perhaps <clears throat> he has stepped away from uh, his computer. I think he's just signed out and maybe he's trying to sign in again. I think there is there's some technological issue here. Okay, well, while we wait for uh, Elias to log back in and then see if we can get him uh, on um, for the reading, let me move on to our next reader and verify uh, in advance if she's present. Yes, indeed she is. That is Alex Santos. She's a freshman from uh, around Baltimore, Maryland. Um, they were part of a speech and a debate for several years and their favorite event was the poetry and prose section. This is their first time public, uh, public reading poetry, publicly reading poetry and their first time participating in the 100,000 Poets for Change. A very warm welcome to you. Alex, uh, please um, take the stage. Hello, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, my poem is from a poet called Matt Harvey from his book, uh, The Element in the Room. It's a poetry book about um, renewable energy. So I like this poem the best. Um, it's called Invocation. Um, so, by the brisk, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, by the brisk, briskness of the breezes, by the freshness of the days, by the churning of the seasons and the parting of the ways, by the fleeting feral forces we can tap but cannot tame, by the scrapping of the barrel, scraping of the barrel, by the fanning of the flame, by the milking of the movements of the waters and the wind by the deep reoccurring rhythms regulations can't rescind, by the rhythms of refusal, by the beating of the drums, the complexity of physics, the simplicity of sums, by the ordinary miracle, every minute, every hour, by the muscle and the molecule, the pervasiveness of power, by the measure of the treasure that will always pass us by, by the awesome orphaned portion of the wind, of the wide, wide sky, <laughs> sorry, by the planning applications, by the placard in the hand, by the opposition's passion, by the curving of the land, let the blessings of the heavens and the good from underground meet completely in the middle, in the country, in the town. May the blessings be accepted, may we know it isn't wrong, to welcome in the guest who's waited patiently so long. By everything that flickers or flies into a rage, by the twist in all our knickers, by the rattle in our cage, uh, one second. 
by the facts we're forced to muster in defense and in attack, by our belief in all our bluster, by the monkey on our back, by the throbbing in the temple, by the fury and the fuss, by the bridge across the chasm, all the way from them to us, by the health and by the safety, by the calculated risk, by the energy encased in our sun's ever slipping disk, by the gifts we take for granted that may one day be withheld, by the many trees we planted and many more we felled, by the curbing of the carbon, by the scarring and the stains, by the carbon in the garden, by the flooding of the plains, by the leaking of the data, by the sneaking of the peak, by the future we're afraid of and the future that we seek. May we mine the seams of sunshine, trap tornadoes in our nets. May our account come into credit as we pay off our regrets. Let the energy be harvested and gathered safely in. Let the argument be ended. Let the reckoning begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I really appreciate this. Uh, again, uh, appreciate your participation as well. Thanks a bunch. And we return now to our ordained Majid sacred storyteller, uh, Elias um, Raymer, who is back. And so, Elias, uh, if you've unmuted yourself, please uh, take the stage. Well, thank you. Thank you. So sorry. Somehow I got bounced out. And I am very glad to be back, honored and delighted. It's my first time here. And thank you, Franklin Abbott, for getting me here. So I want to read two poems from my forthcoming book. And the first one is called Wing Song. And it was written in 2004 for Atlanta artist King Thaxton, whose nickname was Wing or Wingy. And it was written for him and for all the friends and lovers who died of AIDS. And again, it is called Wing Song. I carry you on my back. I carry every one of you who has died on my back. You are not a burden. Your weight is exalting. Each one of you is an other feather in my arched wings. You carry me. Every one of you carries me higher and higher into my life, into the physical life I live for every one of you. When I sleep, you sleep too. When I dance, you dance too. When I pray, you are praying with me. And every time I kiss another man, each one of you pressed up behind my lips is drinking too. Swan, hummingbird, Egret, eagle, drinking. I drink for all of you. I drink with all of you. Together, 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 all of us are drinking, living, flying. And the second one is called The Song of Father Earth, and I wrote it last March. Something is wrong here, something painful. I, I can't listen to the news, a cousin calls in tears, the air is bad, an other friend is dying. And a deep lament rises up now in our dreams, awakening us to ancient memories of how things were before we called Earth Mother, when we still called Sky Mother, Creator, Holy, Only God. Deep, ancient memories collide with the wrongs that we have done in the ways we've been living here. And yet, in spite of all that we have done to harm you, your 
body is beautiful. Father Earth, hard and strong and powerful, ancient, fertile, soft, wet, living. And though we have forsaken you, ignored your father limits, leveled your sacred groves, exterminated your creatures, misaligned your seasons, your body is beautiful, Father Earth, hard and strong and powerful, ancient, fertile, soft, wet, living. Birds dying, trees dying, we ourselves all slowly dying, and yet your body is beautiful, Father Earth, hard and strong and powerful, ancient, fertile, soft, wet, living. Sea wash. Land swept, sky haloed, life haven. Holy your body, holy your streams, rivers, oceans, forests, the life still growing up from you. And as we remember this, act from it, all becomes holy, holy, holy once again. And this is the song of Father Earth, a song of salvation sung in this sacred time of holy dedication to you, 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 you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, appreciate your participation and really, uh, you know, powerful presentation uh, as it is. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to our next poet, uh, a fellow poet from Pakistan and a dear friend, Ilona Yusuf. Uh, she's a professor. Uh, her professional work involves running a design studio specializing in lighting and conversation piece furniture. But word and image are integral elements of her existence. She's a poet and printmaker, combining text and print to make artists' books. Her poems have been published in book form. Um, picture this was published in 2001 and thereafter in literary journals in Pakistan and abroad, both in print and online. She freelances for several magazines, writing on art and literature and Pakistani poetry in English, has edited the short-lived Alhambra Literary Review, and has worked as a guest editor for a special issue of Pakistani poetry in English for the Canadian journal, Vellum. She's currently the associate editor of the literary journal, The Aleph Review, which is indeed a splendid uh, production. Um, every issue is a masterpiece in itself. So I'm welcoming Ilona Yusuf um, and invite her to present her poetry. Thank you, Akas, for having me here. Um, it's my first time on, on this um, platform. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, all right. So I'll just go ahead. Um, I have three poems, they're all very different. Um, the first one is called Limestone, and uh, I love the color of limestone. It seems to both reflect and absorb light. So this is limestone. <clears throat> Not the hard, compacted fists of rock formed of fire, high shined in water, but permeable grain. I'm still not sure why I like it. Like it? I'm fascinated. Perhaps because it's formed from life, slow flattened under water's weight. Real fay that carry the stamp of bone, liquid congealed, soft whispers, life's exhalations. 
Slices then thrown up, sharp slammed, folds crisscrossing, splitting, shaly flat fragments, conglomerations, stones pressed together, honeycombed, noduled, fissures, elongations where water's melted rock to take its flowing shape, then settled in hidden pools, channels. Something else too, luminosity, as if rocks embedded memory of life is lit from within. Um, the second poem is called Voice Box. Um, I wrote it, uh, this was a time in my life when my mother had passed away and my father was like very, very ill. So, and I made very frequent trips to another city. So this is called Voice Box. And it's written after, like months after uh, my father passed away. So the dog days, the dog days are over, she sings in a cottage in the hills on a monsoon night, soft with the percussion of crickets. My mind winds back, night driving with my son. And this song, this voice, first heard carrying, carrying a wing on our speed. And even though we drove towards a death, deep space, ink sky, dark earth enfolded us. And this sound, breath, air, held resonant, rapturous, ringing notes set free. I use very few words, so I'm never sure whether um, when I read the poems, they have the impact that they might have on the page. Um, the third poem is in a way political. It's, it describes probably, well, it, it does describe the, um, let's say the, well, as, as part of the title is the mechanics of hearing. Um, but I, my intention was to talk about how sometimes we do listen and sometimes we consciously choose not to listen or choose to ignore things which are very, which are very visible or very audible. So this is listen and it's divided into two parts. One is the mechanics of hearing. Hammer, anvil, stirrup. Three bones and a membrane sandwiched midway along a concealed tunnel. Minuscule bones working in the harmony of sequential movement strike the tympanum, membrane stretched taut across a hollow body to receive a myriad chromatic inflections. Past the cone of light, in and out, back and forth, to and fro, the little hammer pushes waves past anvil and stirrup, past a forest of fiber swaying liquid in the labyrinth of chamber on spiral chamber, inland sea sounding within a shell, filtering, translating kaleidoscopes of sound, so that amidst cacophony, a single clear note cuts through the air, filling it with pure sound. Part two is the mechanics of silence. And then there is erasure, a willful act to close the ear to sounds it does not wish to perceive or hear, to rub away voice, to stiffen the amaranthine flexing of this assembly of moving parts, to dull the mo movement of hammer, anvil, stirrup against the tympanum, that it loses elasticity, that it idles untuned, that it unlearns the shape of words, the reading of sound, the exercise of speech, that it rubs away voice, that it ossifies in silence, overwhelmed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilona. Really appreciate your contributions and glad you could make it and share with us your beautiful poems. Thank you so much. Uh, we move on to our next participant, Alan Sugar, 
uh, shares his poetry in Decatur, Georgia, where he recently resides. He's also a puppeteer and he has worked as a special education teacher in the public schools of Atlanta. Currently retired, he now works part-time as a writing tutor at Perimeter College, Georgia State University. Alan finds much comfort in writing his poems. They allow him to express most of all a need for balance, wholeness, and self. Uh, Alan, please um, take the stage, the digital stage here. Thank you so very much. I'd like to share a, a poem that I call Parade. The secret unrevealed, the love suppressed, the door that's locked to which we hold the key. We welcome not the stranger as a guest, ignoring all that's wild, untamed and free. It's all around for everyone to see but all we really feel remains repressed. We keep concealed all that we want to be and never know we share a common quest. Our roots are one, we're branches of a tree. We reach out to the rain and we are blessed. It is a spring that sings inside of me, in you, the bird about to leave its nest. And so it is that even as we hide, we wander on, each walking side by side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it, Alan. Uh, what a moving, beautiful, lyrical piece this was. Uh, thank you for your participation. This is your first time, I believe. And so, again, really uh, grateful for your presence. We have our next poet, uh, Ken, uh, who's participated on multiple occasions. I'm very glad she's here. Tuwanda Muhammad is a poet and playwright. Her poetry is inspired by life, scripture, and nature. She has uh, performed at the Decatur Book Festival, Mother May I uh, Theater Program, Java Monkey Speaks, 100,000 Poets for Change, and the MLK Day of Service. A very warm welcome to you, Tawanda. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, read some Maya Angelou, Dr. Maya Angelou. I've been looking for some inspirational poems, and um, she has quite a few of them. So the first poem I'm going to read by Dr. Maya Angelou is Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like tears, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, cause I laugh like I got gold mines digging in my own backyard? You may shoot me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts 
that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And my second and last poem about the Maya Angelou is life doesn't frighten me. And I mean, I'm a frightened by a lot of things. So this poem really inspires me about the Maya Angelou. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Mean old mother goose, lions on the loose, they don't frighten me at all. Dragons breathing flame on my counterpane, that doesn't frighten me at all. I go boo, make them shoo. I make fun, way they run. I won't cry so they fly. I just smile, they go wild. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tough guys in a fight all alone at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the park, strangers in the dark. No, they don't frighten me at all. That new classroom where boys all pull my hair, kissy little girls with their hair in curls, they don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Not at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really, Tawanda. Again, very inspirational poetry. Uh, and I appreciate your sharing uh, this, this poetry. Okay, so this brings to a close our second session. And uh, we'll take a little break, 15 minutes, and then reconvene. Um, our next session starts at 3.15, so we'll start a little bit before that um, so that everything is in place for us to start uh, right on time. Um, and please, those of you who can uh, join us for the final session, do so. We have, uh, again, some outstanding uh, poets who will be uh, reading in that session and uh, hope to see you all there as well. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have a little break now. <laughs>